This is part two of Dr. Tony's talk on infections of the eye. Um, so we'll progress on to uveitis. How many of you have been asked about treating a uveitis in the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so knowing a lot of this, okay. Um, so the, you need to um, understand what the areas of the body is. What is the uvea? Um, it's actually comprised of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. And even that's not really part of it, uh, for part of the discussion with uveitis, they include the retina. Um, so it's really the, the internal coating, if you will, of the eye, um, back behind, uh, some of it's behind the lens. And you can have a pan uveitis where just everything is inflamed. So you see the, the top left picture there with this person with a red eye. And what would be the first thing you might think of? Come in with a red eye like that. AKC or EKC, right? It's a red eye. You might think it's adeno. You have to get past looking at adeno because that's not adeno. They have a uveitis and it may show up like that. So if it's lasted more than a couple of days, it, they really need to be seen by an ophthalmologist who can then take you know, a slit lamp and look at that and then look internally and see what's going on. Um, if you look at the um, top right one, there's, you really have to look at this and there it, it's telling you there's the uveitis. And how do you know it besides that the eye is really red and you see the ciliary blush around where the, the conjunctiva go on, um, goes up to the, uh, the cornea as well. Sorry. Yeah, it's they have an irregular pupil, and that's not normal. Uh, what about the bottom uh, left one? Yeah, what's going on with that eye? The whole they're, they're, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're trying to grow a cat eye. Yeah. So no, those are actually it's inflammation in the anterior chamber. What you're seeing, what I used to just tell people was, it's almost like a spot weld, where the inflammation is enough. To where that the iris is actually tacked on to the uh, anterior part of the lens capsule so that you can see that. And so if you try and dilate it, that's going to be the, the weirdest looking pupil that you've seen. Um, so what's the one that I'm sure you'll get shown a picture and you need to know what that is. What's the bottom middle picture? It's right on the, right on the, the macula. What is it? No. Try again. Top side. That's very, very classic looking toxin. Yeah. The middle. The middle toxin. Now, the one on the right, um, I, I can't tell you what it is, but that, that's what you can see when you're looking at the retina uh, with somebody who's got uveitis. You see the, the texture is not consistent with a normal looking retina. Um, you can see it, it looks a little odd even around the macula. Remember, the macula is like two and a half disc spaces over. So when you're looking, you know, does the macula look okay? And down doesn't look okay. I mean, it's really red looking. I mean, they should look reddish anyway, but there's this like blush around it. And there's something you could do if you were taking your direct ophthalmoscope to try and help you look at that and see what else is going on. And there's something on the uh, direct ophthalmoscope that can really help you. If you're trying to look and see, uh, it looks like maybe there's some hemorrhages in there, and but you know, it's kind of hard to tell. How would you know? We used to do this all the time for diabetes, looking for uh, or uh, hypertension, looking for flame hemorrhages and everything else. There's a little, yeah. What color would you change it to? Green. You can use green. Some have green, some have blue. What does that do? So that will probably like. Some of the colors. Yeah, it does. Uh, so you're looking at it, and what it does is it makes red look really intense. It's not an intense red, but it's like a darker bluish. So it's much easier to see if you have a hemorrhage um, or you know a leak or something else. So that's why it's on there. But I guarantee you, ask a med student, they don't know. You ask them what a direct ophthalmoscope is, and they may not know because nobody does. That. Um, so when you're looking at uveitis, this is. Uh, this is not new data, this is from 1996, and this is from uh, over 1,200 people seen at uh, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear, and uh, it was quite interesting. And overall, 
uh, 80% of uveitis was either rheumatologic or idiopathic from their investigations, and they do really good investigations, and only about 20% overall were infectious, but it, it differs depending on what area of the eye that you're looking at. So anteriorly, uh, you see that out of this group, that it was uh, mainly herpes, syphilis, and TB. Uh, it was a rare, rare, rare occurrence with uh, intermediate uveitis. Or I'm sorry, yeah, intermediate uveitis. Posterior uveitis generally was going to be uh, toxoplasmosis, acute retinal necrosis, CMV, syphilis, and TB. And pan uveitis, even though it wasn't all that common, was syphilis, TB, and fungal. So just to show you that data a little bit more broken down, what's the first thing as an ID person you should do if the um, you have either my favorites are econs. Hi, I've got a guy with uveitis. What do I treat him with? <laughs> well, you could try Obacalp. What the heck is Obacalp? Obacalp is placebo spelled backwards. No, you shouldn't use that. Um, the first question back to that person is, what type of uveitis is it? Anterior, posterior, hand uveitis? Do they have? Then you can say, well, what do you think it is? And okay. But if they don't know and they're asking you, where's it located? And if they can't tell you that, then you say, I don't know what you want. I mean, I really don't. Because I, you have to tell me what area of the eye is most involved with this. If it's a pan uveitis, 10% are infectious. It's either going to be secondary syphilis, usually TB, or a fungal endophthalmitis, and I'm not getting into that argument now about whether or not to have ophthalmology see if you think they have a fungal endophthalmitis. Uh, the IDSA says, yes, yes, you should. The American Ophthalmic uh, Association or their society, AA, AAS or AAOS, I can't remember, says, no, you don't really need that. Why? Because they don't hospital scare them, and they don't like coming to us. Ask Dr. Glockenflecken, he's what he says. <laughs> Uh, I said, I don't like letting nostrils, they scare me. Um, so, I, I, I mean, we have. Um, but if you're looking anterior, about 10% are infectious. Most of that's going to be uh, either HSV or VZV. 1% may be syphilis out of that, um, rarely TB, and a scattering of maybe some other things. Uh, if it's uh, intermediate, it's really, really uncommon for it being around in that part of the eye. And the one thing that does come up occasionally is Lyme. So then you'd have to get a history of where is this person, you know, their reptic bites, yada, yada. Um, posterior, it's almost 50-50 non-infectious and infectious. So um, looking at posterior, like you saw that picture, most of it uh, is probably going to be toxo. Uh, acute retinal necrosis or ARNs, usually uh, HSV or VZV. Uh, you can see, remember back in the battle days of HIV, that we would see CMV retinitis a lot. Um, syphilis and TB. So these are just some things to consider. Um, I would suggest that you, you know, be happy to send this to you as a, you know, PDF or whatever. Um, but remember this part because that's just have it as a reference. I mean, I don't care if you memorize it or not. But if they're saying somebody has a posterior uveitis, you need to understand what is going on. And if they show you a picture, uh, it might really help. So now we're moving out of what's inside the eye to what's outside of the eye and looking at preceptal and orbital cellulitis. The old name for preceptal was periorbital um, because it wasn't inside the orbit, it was around the outside of the orbit. Um, so how do you get cellulitis? This area is either direct extension from uh, focal eyelid uh, or orbital infection, an extension from a sinus infection, from orbital trauma, from orbital or sinus surgery, or it may come through the blood vessels, could be a vascular extension of uh, uh, bacteremia or a facial cellulitis. Uh, what's one of the one things that you tell people not to do if they've got a zit like on their nose or around oh, that? Yeah. Yes, the, the danger triangle, yes, indeed, because it is. Uh, what's the worst thing that can happen from that? <laughs> yes. Cavernous venous thrombosis, infected cavernous venous thrombosis, which is even worse. So what's the success rate management of that? Depends on your experience. If you've never treated one, it's either going to be 100% or 0% <laughs> in your series of one. Um, if you catch it early, uh, it, it, it's, it has a significant morbidity 
and certainly mortality to it. I can't tell you what the percent is because I haven't looked that up recently. But um, we look at preceptal um, cellulitis, uh, and both of these present with redness and uh, an erythematous, edematous, warm uh, orbits. The lids are definitely abnormal. They can be red, they can be swollen. Um, and so when you're looking at orbital cellulitis, there's a difference. What's the difference? What's one of the big things that you tell you about with having infection inside the eye that gives you an idea that it's in the eye and not a periorbital or a preceptal? Yeah, if you say, look over here and go, oh, can't, hurts too bad. Then what are you doing? CT scan, because <laughs> there's something going on in the eye and you need to figure out where is it, what's going on. So blurred vision, diplopia, um, I have in my lab coat a red lens. When people tell me that, you know, I, I have double vision. And so what you have to do is put the red filter over one eye, have the other one open, <coughs> hold a pen light in front of them. They should see a red image and a white image from the light, correct? They're usually on top of each other. If, they're, if you have them look up, look down, look to the left, look to the right, if those split, then they have diplopia. So one eye is not confocal with the other one. And if you do it, you can actually figure out which one of their um, accessory muscles of their eye is not working really well. And you can do this to, you know, be the life of the party and, and challenge the ophthalmologist when they're saying, oh, well, we have this big machine that people do. And you go, okay, no, I just did it now. It's their abducens is apparently weak for whatever the reason. And they're like, but you're an internist. No, I'm an infectious disease. <laughs> and then they understand. Uh, so any of that is a problem. The signs of it, obviously, looking at it, is their eye proptotic? Um, can they not move their eye? Uh, and realistically, in a kid, uh, trying to get information, you know, and this child who's having a lot of pain is going to be difficult. So about the best thing to do is get a CT scan. Um, usually it's going to require IV antibiotics. And, um, not uncommonly, it's either going to be MSSA uh, or MRSA. And these are not the only things that you could use um, to treat with. Um, you may end up, depending on how bad things are, treating and adding different antibiotics. Um, I did see last year a lady uh, on the weekend who was in the ICU, and I'm sure some of you saw him or saw her as well. Um, I think it was her, no, it was it was a guy uh, who had MRSA bacteremia and had this eye that looked really injected and everything. So I actually did go and try and find a direct ophthalmoscope, and I could see like hardly anything. And so I told my ophthalmologist, you needed to come in because I thought they had, you know, staph um, end ophthalmitis from it. So they came in, they agreed that it was that. The other eye wasn't that bad. Um, they were saying, well, we don't know that we really, you know, would worry about that eye because it looks like it's not probably not salvageable. But uh, so they were putting moxifloxacin in the eye, which actually at the dose that they use can, there is some data that can be uh, useful for MRSA. And the recommendation was for me to change my Banco, and I forget what else they were on, to moxifloxacin to treat their MRSA bacteremia. I was worried about endocarditis, and I politely refused. I said, it, it may be okay in the eye, but it's not for the rest of the body. Uh, there is a very low threshold for uh, surgical drainage, or, or if there's an abscess, the best way to treat it, if you can, is drain the abscess. So these are the areas that you're thinking about um, if you're looking, you know, I mean, it's kind of a cartoon drawing, but it gets the point across where the periosteum is. Uh, with a diffuse cellulitis, everything is infected. If it's an orbital abscess, you can see where it may be pushing on the optic nerve, and you can see that on a CT scan. You can also see subperiosteal abscesses, um, and you can see a cavernous sinus thrombosis from this. So just looking at some of these CT scans, um, if you look at the ones on the left, Look at the top left. What do you see? And I know you're seeing it's, it's two eyeballs. Yes. And you can actually see the lens in the, uh, the right eye on that one. But yeah, what's, what's wrong in that left orbit? Yeah. Yes. And why? When you look at it, you can compare the top to the bottom since you're looking at, yeah, and looking at a sagittal cut as well. So you can see it much better. And the one down below where it seems to be coming from the, you know, more the, uh, the top to lateral part of the orbit, it is pushing the eye somewhat. Um, 
and you know, it would be nice to, uh, if you can, get rid of that. What do you think the source is for that? And you can tell that from the CT scan. Yeah, I mean, look at that side. I mean, it's like a pansonusitis on the left-hand side. Okay, compare that to uh, what you see on the right-hand side. That eye looks horrible, right? At the right upper one, it looks like somebody really popped him in the eye. Um, but that's not what was going on. Uh, but that is a preceptal, or if you will, periorbital cellulitis. So if you have them, you know, look with their, um, you're not going to see the right, I mean, you can if you pull it open, but have them, you know, do lateral gaze, and if they can move their eye and it's not that bad, then it's probably not an orbital cellulitis. So the ones that are tougher, like the middle one with kids, uh, one of the reasons that I don't do pediatrics is uh, the first time I we, we were doing uh, peds and ID when I was in training, and I went to see a two-year-old who was in the PDICU who had uh, staph endocarditis, and she was amazingly cute. I mean, she was a beautiful little girl, and she was going to die. And that was that was the end of me doing that because I, I had young ones then. I was like, nope, can't do this. Um, so I, I really feel for people who are doing pediatric ID and some of the things that they see. Uh, so if you look down at the bottom, you see that the sinuses look okay uh, on that bottom right CT, and most of the swelling and everything else is more of the lid itself and not into the orbit. So that really helps your therapy because you know it's not something that you're going to have to uh, go into and try and drain a sinus or something else. Do you have to order, like, specifically orbital Oh, I mean, sure. I, you know, and you want to give the radiologist information, right? Um, that's like saying, you know, uh, in a, days before they told you that you have to give me a reason to get a PA and lateral chest X-ray. We used to store PA and lateral in there. I mean, the amount of overreading and everything on them was crazy. But now you have to give them a reason. The reason for this is, you know, um, you can just suggest to them it's either. Um, you know, a periorbital or orbital uh, or preceptal, whichever term you like, um, cellulitis attention to orbits so that they know they, what you, they know what you want. And if you're really not sure, call them and say, I got this patient and here's what's going on. I need a CT and I really need for you to look, you know, in the fourth space and look. And if you want to do coronals as well, that'd be great with me. So then you can see the best you can. Um, one of the things that's, you know, we see sometimes that you can see at the top is, again, it's tough. The other eye looks fine. So that's probably going to be a preceptal cellulitis. And if you open that eye, you might see some chemosis. That doesn't guarantee you that it's all preceptal. Occasionally, you can see chemosis as that eye is getting pushed forward. The other thing that worries me about that is somebody shining a light on that eye and it, it, the pupil's pretty dilated. So I don't know if they're putting drops in there or what, but um, just interesting. So if you look at the uh, CT, over on the other side, what do you see? The sinuses look okay, but that that orbit doesn't look so hot. And I think I, I having ophthalmology looking at that um, as well. Okay, so endogenous endophthalmitis, um, like two to fifteen percent of all endophthalmitis is going to be endogenous, which means they got a bacteremia and they seeded the eye out of themselves. It wasn't due to a surgical procedure or trauma or something else. Um, most of that's going to be fungal. Uh, gram positive, about 33% from past studies, and gram negative, about 5%. Uh, so you can just imagine what the ED is going to put them on. They'll be on Zosin, Venko, and what? Maybe fluconazole or something, because they know the data, which is not going to work. Um, so the risk factors, obviously, is anything injection that they've been doing, so uh, injection drug use, uh, any major surgery in that area, uh, or anything that can make them bacteremic, uh, especially things that we end up doing, treating people kind of long-term with antibiotics um, because we're putting in a PICC line or something else that can get, fortunately, infected. If it happens to be a bacterial infection, yeah, it can go the eye. Again, it's uncommon, but it can. And, um, and sometimes these, if they're in for um, uh, hyperalimentation, and so they're, you know, they have a lot of glucose going through them, they can grow fungi. Um, if they have HIV, malignancy is getting treated, so they're uh, immune suppressed, or any of the things you see on that list are chronic immune compromising, debilitating diseases, put people at risk for those. Um, the top one, 
similar to one that we saw several years ago of a guy who got uh, had Canada endophthalmitis, and that's about the best you could see of the retina. Uh, the vitreous was pretty cloudy. Um, they not have to do a vitrectomy. Sometimes they do where they take um, and just remove um, the vitreous and put in uh, you know, either normal saline or occasionally, if it's really bad, they'll put in something like silicone oil. Um, that kind of changes. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, when you think about that, putting in an oil, and you're like, I don't know about that. You remember back when you were doing micro, and they give you, if you're going to do an oil immersion, what do you put on that slide? You put it on the condenser, and then you put the slide on it, that immersion oil. Do you remember when it has the little glass probe that goes into it and you see it go down into the oil and then it disappears and you really hard to see it. It's the same thing in the eye. You don't change the reactive uh, or the um, reflect, yeah, the reflective index too much of things. So it, it's about the same. It's obviously not perfect and it's not for everybody, but um, that's what they tend to do on some of these. But this is a person who got treated for six weeks for candida endophthalmitis and you see a pretty reasonable looking retina after that. I will also mention to you these because we may or may not be asked to see them. I have been, uh, over the course of my career, asked to see some of these uh, who've had nasty pictures of dacrocystitis or infection of the dacrocystitis. Um, so usually that one people know because they can usually see it. And then what do they try and do with it? Oh, it's got to be an infection. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to squeeze. <laughs> yeah. And when they tell me what they did, just part of the hairs on my back just start standing up and I'm like, oh no, it's going to be bad. Um, so anyway, sudden onset of pain, erythema or edema overlying the lacrimal sac region. Um, and remember now that you're, you're, when you're talking about dacrocystitis, really what we're talking about is, you know, looking at the corner of the eye, you're looking at the lacrimal uh, duct, not the lacrimal gland, which is up in this area. So you're making tears and it washes down over the eye kind of in this fashion. So everything's kind of get washed to um, down into the puncta area. So if the puncta gets clogged and things start growing in it, I mean, that's generally what we end up calling dacrocystitis. Although you can see people with a big eye that's all swollen up, you know, under the kind of the lid area. Um, those are not really common. At least we don't see them. They go to ophthalmology. Uh, the biggest issue, if you start closing off your lacrimal duct is epiphoria or tearing. Um, epiphoria will probably get you the um, high I know more than you do and jeopardy and um, you know I don't know I've ever heard anybody say epiphoria but I'm sure it's in an ophthalmology note somewhere. Um, if it gets really bad they can get sick from this and obviously you don't want it to extend into the eye with all the things that we just looked at uh, with uh, cavernous venous thrombosis and maybe death from that. So you know, obviously it doesn't look normal. Um, the one I can really remember was that I was asked to go down to the ED to see this person and ask him, well, how long has this been going on? He said, I don't remember, two or three weeks. And I I, I loved it because the ED physician said, so you rushed right in. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, that, that's kind of cruel, but it's, it's really, I mean, you know, this is pushed up into your eye. It was similar to this guy on the bottom. Um, and it was really concerning. So, um, yeah, he ended up getting it. Okay, lightning round. Lightning round. I get to ask you all questions. So, you see these two pictures on there. What is, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Chlamydia. What kind of chlamydia? Don't tell me bad chlamydia. I'm sorry? Chlamydia trachomatis. That would be correct for the infection. Okay, which which type of chlamydia in this one? D through K. Huh? D through K. D through K. Is that your final answer? Phone a friend. Yeah, phone your friend. I don't know if phones work in this building, but building forty one, you cannot phone a friend. So, what what is this called? Somebody said it. Cobblestoning. Cobblestoning, okay. But what's the name of the disease? Trachoma. trachoma. And you're correct, it is due to chlamydia trachomatis, but it's the A, B, and C variants, right? So when you're looking at this, and so what's going on? So what you see is the cobblestoning that you can see with this. 
Um, and it's weird that you see the hair, the, um, the follicles on, you know, looking at um, on the lids is really prominent. The other thing that you can see is when you look at the picture on the right, look at the lashes. Most of them are kind of broken off. They're funny looking. The other thing is this chronic inflammation causes the lid to actually get pulled down into when you're blinking. You've got these wonderful broken hairs that are scraping your cornea. And so you can get bacterial infections with this. There is, and now it's going in through 2023, a, uh, a world project that's trying to get rid of chlamydia trachoma, that's trying to get rid of trachoma. They almost kind of did it, but COVID kind of set things back a few years. Um, and it's giving what to treat this? They go in like every six months to all these different communities and stuff, and they give them. Nope. Easy. What knows? Well, a gram. You got it. They give them a gram of AZ. Uh, about every six months, they'll, they'll return back and they try and find as many people in town and they treat them all. And it's been working really well. Could you use Doxy for this too then? Uh, you could. could. So you have to treat them for like, you know, um, 10 days, two weeks. Single dose therapy. Like, the museum and like the Statue of Liberty. They used to like screen people coming into the U.S. with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this yes. isn't the sexually transmitted no. and this is like the, the flies, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, this is non-sexually transmitted. So the sexually transmitted one is D through F is the um, D through K. Yeah. Okay. Um and the other ones are the ones that you don't oh, think, they're, think of they're the more they're not really the, the urothelial <laughs> oh. <laughs> versions, which these tend to be ribald. Um, but if you're looking at the L strains, they're, they're L because they go after lymphatics. And that's the ones you see causing, you know, boobos, et cetera. Just don't worry. Okay. All right. Moving on. We'll rewind this and listen to it ad infinitum after this discussion. Okay. So just to let you know, so here's the discussion, trachoma. Um, so at least 8 million people, estimated 84 million people with active disease. Um, there's the serotypes from that A, B, B, A, and C. D through K is sexually transmitted. Blinded complications are because of scarring and corneal exposure, especially with trichiasis, with the lashes being broken off. If you see the bottom picture, it's hard to see really any lashes on there at all. Um, and the treatment is AZ and obviously facial hygiene and keeping hands away from eyes. And it is still uh, a part of the global elimination of coma, trying now by the year 2030. Okay. Oh. This patient comes in and tells you he's got a weird sensation in his eye. Yo, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who wants to tell me? <laughs> Who's going to give me the syndromic title? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> with this, it, it's not too hard because you can see it. Um, so here's, I don't know what age, um, a person who comes in. Uh, let's say that they travel to Africa and come back with a present. And uh, they're, yes, it's like an SPD, you know, it's that gift that keeps on giving. Uh, this one is causing an issue in their eye. And tell me what you see. What is it? It's a worm. What's the name of the worm? So that's a... Uh, it's similar to that song, Louie Louie, but it's low, low. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it's got to go. Um, so how do you get rid of that? What do you treat it with? What do you do? You have to get a drug from the CDC and it's a pain in the butt to get. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> you can have an ophthalmologist who's quite adept with small micro instruments pull the sucker out of there. Uh, uh, see, here's the problem. If it, what if it's A, what if it's disseminated? B, what if the opto resin has already pushed it in the back of his eye? <laughs> yeah. And he's going, I don't see a problem. You're going, go, then you don't have vision. <laughs> so you're, you're correct. So this is going to be uh, one of the issues. Okay. This patient comes in to see you. He's complaining about his eyes are burning. They've been burning for quite a while, and you're the, uh, the adept professor that you are, and you see that this has some skin issues going on. What does this person have? Yeah. <sighs> and how do you know that? What's with the cute little mnemonic? Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. 
Yeah, well, that was not what we called it, but that's what everybody's talking about now. So what are the conditions besides having the conjunctivitis that you can see? What's that called uh, on the glands of his penis? What's that called? Yeah. You, you about have it. Balanitis. Yeah, cercinate balanitis. Uh, and what about the foot? Very good. Uh, yes. Actually, there was a patient that we had who had, had HIV and he had these funny looking lesions on his feet. And I thought it looked exactly like that. And I couldn't remember what it was. So I had one of the rheumatologists who used to be here uh, to go in and, and see what he thought. And um, so he came out and said, congratulations. Yes. At that time, it was writers. He has writers. And everybody's like, oh, he didn't have writers. I said, Dr. Espinosa says he does, and he's a smart guy, so that's what it is. And that's what he had. Um, so he had reactive arthritis or writers. Um, what can cause that? And it can't involve the eyes, since that's why it's on here. Is there an infection that's associated with this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, and some non-infectious things can give you a reactive arthritis, but usually not with, um, the other skin manifestations with the keratoderma, etc. What is the foot thing called again? Keratoderma lenorrhagica. Yeah. Don't you wish it was like a name of a grand positive caucus or something? <laughs> Be so impressive. Okay, this actually is a lady who came to see us here uh, several years ago. She was a 28 year old veteran and she was referred to us by primary care because she had this lid that you can see looked red, her eye was red, and it's kind of hard to appreciate, but she's got a, a small lymph node that was uh, tender on the left side of her face. So what do you think? We got a history. I'll give you a hint. The cat in the corner, very subtle there. <laughs> there it's gone. <laughs> it's back. All right. So she has a cat. Interestingly enough, she would hold the cat on the left side. Not <laughs> say, but um, maybe that's what caused her to have. What do you think is going on with this? What does she have? Serologically, yes. <laughs> Yeah, did I put that in? I don't remember if I did. So she has cat scratch. Yes. As Ted Nugent would say. Of course. Um, and so what's the treatment for this? The treatment for cat scratch. Bartonella. Doxy? Doxy? Use Doxy, but what's a better This is a board question. Is it for my Microlides. Yep, microlides. So actually, we uh, treated her, and she did quite well. Okay. I mean, if you want to... The eyeball? I'm sorry? Did the cats scratch her eyeball? No, no, no. You don't have to. The cats... What else do the cats do? Cats groom themselves, right? So they lick themselves all over. And now she's holding up there, so all it is is just... It's a contact. Was it the lymphadenopathy that gave it away, or did you do serologic testing? No, we did serologic. Okay. I mean, we figured that's probably what it was after you get a history, and we went ahead and treated her, mm -hmm. and... Fortunately, things have gotten better because serology, when I was a resident, is something that you ordered and you never, ever saw again. Because it was just, it would take months to get serology back. Because they had to send it to an outside lab, and then it would just take them forever to get it back. And it was in a paper chart, and then you would just never see it. <laughs> it's in a computer, and you didn't see it. Okay, now this one's really, just the last one here is really difficult, so I want you to pay attention. Oh, I'm sorry, I had that paranoid <laughs> doctor. Uh, so these are some of the things to think about, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, cat scratch and having, it's a granulomous conjunctivitis in one eye as well and left node in front of the ear on the same side, so on the epilateral side. So you think about it with, and that's not a complete list, but some of the things that you should think about, Bartonella is on there, Francisella tularensis, which causes what? Sorry. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it can, but you know what? Life can end in death too, so <laughs> it doesn't help. So what is Francisella tularensis? See, all the great names from Louis Pasteur, the father of microbiology, have been changed. Now it used to be Pasteurella, right? 
was Pastorella tularensis. All these, uh, so what, what is now well, Francisella tularensis? Was it, what's the name of the disease? Plague. Plague. Oh. Yeah, easy. Uh, as he said, Beth. So, um, but yeah, so it's giving you inocular glandular syndrome, herpes. And remember, we talked about that, a couple of the others in this talk that can give you uh, a paranoid uh, and paracoxy. So the management is you you give them basically a Z-pack and most of them do fine. Okay. Ooh, what do these two people have in common? They're older. They're older. <laughs> yeah, and that's a bad sign. Um, so as you were showing me this, Dr. Zawaki, what is that called? No, that's called a nose. So, <laughs> but you had it right now. So what did you say? You got it right. HSV. Yeah. yeah, so that's VZD. And you were right. That's called Hutchinson's sign. So that's caused by um, involvement of the nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic nerve, right? Okay. Uh, even if you don't have, like this lady on the left, that was when I actually, when I, um, my, why am I blanking now? The penguin. Cut that out. Don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was another person's um, patient, and she has classic Hutchinson sign. Uh, so if it goes down to the tip of the nose, uh, that's it. But it doesn't have to, and you can still have uh, eye involvement. Now, she does have some swelling and everything else, but if you looked at her eye, she doesn't have true eye involvement. But um, the guy on the right was, when I was an ID fellow, was a guy that we saw here. He had small cell of the lung. It was interesting because he developed this. We were asked to see him because of that. He looked in the inside and half of his palate is ulcerative. Um, ENT came in to see him, diagnosed him as having mucor and left and never came back. Um, so we decided it wasn't mucor <laughs> and, uh, and treated this guy and he did very well. So what do, what do these people have again? So they've got shingles or paracel zostrum. Um, so when you're looking at this, I mean, these are some things to worry about with this. Uh, you know, if it gets into the eye, it's a big deal. And if you start seeing zoster around the eye or have Hutchinson sign, I, I don't feel bad about having an ophthalmologist see them because I have seen them come back, excuse me, uh, with having other problems with this, um, like a postherpetic neuralgia we would see, but you know, having it as an aseptic meningitis, I saw a patient a couple of years ago here who'd had, um, uh, V1 zoster, that had healed up fine, but then he started getting really crazy and uh, go in to see him, and he ended up having, a, a quote, an aseptic meningitis from this. Um, but a lot of things to think about with this. What else does zoster do? It increases for uh, anywhere from one to three months the chance of you having two things. Stroke. Stroke. What else? Heart attack. Yep. So it increases your chance of having a stroke and an MI. Uh, depending on which literature you look at, for at least 30 days up to 90 days after having zoster. So it's something to watch. People. Yeah. Uh, just, it's more common when you start looking at the face area. Uh, that's probably 80%, but it can be associated with some of the others. Um, drugs to use. I, it drives me absolutely crazy when people start giving them acyclovir to take. I have seen people treating zoster with 200 milligrams of acyclovir five times a day. What does BCV do when it sees acyclovir at that dose? Laughs. It laughs, it scoffs. It's like, go away, you're not, I don't, you don't worry me. That is not an adequate dose for BCV. That's a great dose for herpes simplex. It's also a, um, another one of these, if you don't like the patient, prescribe that, because five times a day, nobody's gonna take it. Um, and also remember that the more acyclovir you get, the less out of it is absorbed uh, from acyclovir tablets, only about 15%, maybe if you're lucky, 20% gets absorbed. So the more of it that you give, the less is absorbed. So if you're giving them, uh, let's say, instead of 200 five times a day, if you go to uh, 400 three times a day, you get the same effect. But now you went from a gram a day to 1200 milligrams a day if you're giving 800 milligram caplet, uh, capsules or tab tablets, the big ones. Uh, twice a day. Now you're up to 1,600 milligrams to get the same effect. Well, if you use a prodrug, so if you're using valacyclovir that's bound to valine, right, you can use that for whichever amino acid you'd like. Um, it gets really transported much better across the intestinal uh, brush border, etc. 
and you're getting about 45% of the drug absorbed. You're getting close, but not exactly the same as you get with an IV. So it's a great step down. Famcyclovir is uh, another prodrug, and it's converted in the liver and brush border into what active drug? Hint, it's not a cyclovir. <laughs> You see it usually uh, in some advertisement stuff as a topical that you can buy over the counter to treat um, cold sores. Hint? Pencyclovir, yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, converted into pen, uh, pencyclovir from famcyclovir. There's no difference between the two. They're both about the same absorption. Uh, in our uh, CSP shingle study trial, we use famcyclovir. The thing about also using it, use either of those two. Don't please don't use 800 milligram five times a day of acyclovir. It's punitive dosing. An older person is not going to remember to do that, and it might not have a good outcome. If you can see people with shingles within 72 hours and get them on therapy, the chance of them developing PHN is significantly reduced because now you don't have this active inflammation on dorsal rear ganglia killing off part of the ganglia, which is really what's causing the PHN. Okay. Oh, um, the, the previous slides with the eye involvement, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that is an indication for IVA cycle here, correct? Uh, I, most people kind of are like, oh, you know, is there any randomized controlled trial of doing that? I don't think so of any magnitude. I probably would. I would give them IV if you had it. At least um, for a few days. I yeah, and then just once that it looks stable and it looks like that, you know, that well, in both of these, they've already started crusting, so it's a little too late. But um, I think, you know, but we worry because it's the eye and we worry about, you know, the increased risk of stroke and all. And I think it, I would not have a problem putting them on IV. I think you're perfect. Um, in the eye or? No, just like. Yeah, there was a, a big Australian, yeah. there was a big Australian study where they did that and they saw that um, less of an effect with PHN, but once they followed them out to a year, the lines met and there was no difference. Uh, in the eye, ophthalmologists will definitely want to use it. Valtrex, Valtrex, right? I mean, that's got great bioavailability. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I mean, I'm yeah. really worried maybe IV, but... Either one. You just want higher levels of acyclovir because VZB is um, significantly less susceptible to acyclovir than HSV. That's why you have to give higher doses. It doesn't get good, like, bioavailability is not very good with acyclovir. No. No, and the more you give up, the less it's absorbed. So that's that's one of the reasons why I don't like doing that. Um, and that was out of actually a 2013 New England Journal. It was really a, a good one to look at. Okay, I could not leave this talk without showing you this. This is a 77-year-old woman with CLL who had shingles on the left side of her face about six weeks ago, and then she developed a dendrite in the cornea, uh, which was treated about four weeks ago. She has severe vision loss in the left eye few days ago and then you see retinitis she comes back because of that her uh, vision in the OD which is what yeah the right eye <coughs> OS ocula sinistra <coughs> so the left eye so okay so a vision in her uh, left eye, or in her right eye is 2025 uh, the uh, left eye is hand motion that's not good uh, and so what do you see uh, putting that all together so she has shingles, she has VCV, so it's gotten into her eye, and she has what we would call now acute retinal necrosis. But in the old days, that people would call it progressive outer retinal necrosis. And I couldn't believe it. The first article I saw, they abbreviated it porn, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> porn in medicine. Here we go. So you can tell, you can tell your friends and colleagues, Dr. Tony was showing you porn today. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. This is obviously needs to be treated by an ophthalmologist, um, and these are somewhat difficult to treat. But you can see, isn't it interesting that when you follow this, it's like CMV. When you follow CMV, CMV spreads out from the retinal arteries. So when you look at it, it's this arcuate pattern on there. I mean, we used to either go down and, and see it when they were doing, you know, I inside in the hospital. Um, or you'd see it in the pictures they took and, and showed it to you. But also notice that almost the center of the field, where's the macula? I don't see it. That's why it's like perception only. So there's no macula. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your time. And